very special time of study together. Uh, it's entitled The Sabbath is a Binding in the New Covenant. I'm delighted to be able to introduce my co-moderator for this debate. Chris Bendy is joining me. And in a few moments, we will be having Pastor Doug Batchelor and Steve Gregg that will be presenting different perspectives on this important subject of the Sabbath. Is it still binding on Christians today? Well, whenever you deal with the Word of God, you need to recognize that the Bible is God's book. And in order to correctly understand the Bible, you need the leading of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to ask those here in the audience and those who are joining us online, if you would just bow your heads for a word of prayer. Dear Father, once again, we are grateful for the opportunity to gather together and open up the Bible and study together. And Lord, we ask for the Holy Spirit to come and guide our hearts and our minds as we listen. And maybe there's some things we've never seen before or thought about. And I just pray that your Spirit would guide us as we search the Scriptures to find a clearer understanding of your will for our lives. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to keep our announcements very brief here at the beginning of the program and try to give as much time as possible to our presenters. Uh, Chris, I'd like you to please invite the presenters to come forward. All right, let's have the presenters Doug Batchelor and Steve Gregg come forward. You can welcome them. Thank you. Chris Bandy is going to be the one that's going to be presenting first, and we've got 20 minutes where he'll be uh, presenting his position followed by Doug Batchelor that'll be also presenting 20 minutes and then there's a 10 minute response from both candidates. Uh, before we take our seat and let Chris begin, I would like to quickly introduce Pastor Doug Batchelor. So, sorry, Steve, sorry Chris, you were the one almost that was going to be presenting there for a minute. <laughs> were you nervous a little bit hey, about that? I'm no, ready to roll right? with whatever you're ready you to got. go? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, before we get going on that, let me quickly introduce Pastor Doug Batchelor. Pastor Doug Batchelor is the uh, president of Amazing Facts. Amazing Facts is a Christian media ministry located right here in Sacramento, California, broadcasting uh, through various channels. We have a weekly radio program called Bible Answers Live, and also a number of television programs. Probably the more popular one is Amazing Facts Presents, that is also presented nationwide. And we are delighted that he will be presenting this evening in favor of the Sabbath, meaning Christians keeping the Sabbath in the New Covenant. Okay, and Steve Gregg is the founder of The Narrow Path. It's a radio ministry, and it's also a ministry where um, on their website, thenarrowpath.com, there are just, I can't even think of the word, just tons of MP3 files that you can download with information over all um, the books of the Bible. And uh, it's just so exciting to have Steve uh, present the position on in, um, in rebuttal to the Sabbath not necessarily being binding in the New Covenant. All right, well, with that, we're going to go ahead and, uh, Steve, turn the time over to you. Give us just a few moments to set the clock, and we'll tell you when you're good to go. Right. Thank you, gentlemen. I did pray. <laughs> Now, we're not supposed to have any cheering or any kind of booing or anything like that. So um, I appreciate those who've spoken encouragingly at the beginning, but uh, we do need to make sure this is not uh, something that people are really taking sides about. We're here to study the Bible. Amen to that. And Steve, we're going to have you start your 20 minutes. We'll start in just a moment. And I also want to make sure the presenters are aware when we get down to that one minute slot, we will give you a warning that one minute remains, so you know to, um, to wrap up your, your thoughts there. So, Steve, your time starts now. Well, the position I'm presenting is that the New Covenant is not one of the provisions of the, I should say that the keeping of the Sabbath is not one of the provisions of the New Covenant. It's part of the Old Covenant, which is passed as a New Covenant has been brought in by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. And... Uh, this has been very confusing for many people because in the Old Testament you find many references to the need to observe the Sabbath. Of course, we have to realize the Old Testament was written to somebody called the people of Israel. And this is a covenant that God made with the people of Israel. Oh, by the way, I don't have a clicker. <laughs> so I can't advance the screen. All right, there we go, thank you. Thanks so much. When we come to the New Testament, of course, we don't find any commands at all to keep the Sabbath. And there's, I believe, reasons for that we need to be aware of. 
The Sabbath was, as it says in Exodus 31, a sign that God made between the people of Israel and himself when he made a covenant with them at Mount Sinai. In Exodus 31, 12 through 17, it says, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I, the Lord, who sanctifies you, I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You should keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. Now, there's never any indication that this was a sign between God and any other, other people than Israel, because he made a covenant with Israel at Mount Sinai, and Sabbath was the sign of the covenant. He had made a covenant with Abraham earlier. Circumcision was the sign of that covenant. But the covenant that God made at Mount Sinai, he instituted the Sabbath as the sign of that covenant. Now, he says it twice in the passage we just uh, read. It's a sign between me and the children of Israel, he says. He said it's holy to them because he's sanctifying them. Now, of course, there's no evidence in the Bible that anybody ever kept the Sabbath prior to the time of Moses. True, at the time of creation, it says in Genesis 2-3 that God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. However, what you find in Genesis is no reference to anybody doing anything on the Sabbath day except for God. He rested. He ceased from the work he had been doing, which was a six-day work of creation. Having finished it, he didn't do any more, and therefore he ceased from doing it. There's no evidence that he told anybody else to keep it at that point, nor is there evidence that God ever told anyone to do it before the time of Moses. In fact, in Deuteronomy 5, just before God gives the second reading of the Ten Commandments, it's found in Exodus 20 and also in Deuteronomy 5, Moses said, our Lord, the Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. That's another name from Mount Sinai. The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, those who are here today, all of us who are alive. So Moses made it very clear that the covenant that was made at Mount Sinai was not made with anyone previously. It was not made with their fathers. Now, our fathers is a term that's used throughout the Pentateuch to refer to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God did not make this covenant with them. He made it with the people of Israel who came out of Egypt. And uh, so also, in a few verses later in Deuteronomy 5, verses 12 through 15, we have the Ten Commandments, of course, I given in this chapter. And when it comes to the Sabbath, it says, observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, and therefore means because of that, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. <clears throat> really. So it wasn't an obligation to everybody. It was something God told them to do because he brought them out of Egypt, because he gave them rest from their labors. He said, now I want you to commemorate that every week because I took you out of the land of Egypt from slavery. And because of that, I want you to keep the seventh day holy. Now, God didn't bring anyone else out of Egypt that I know of except the, land, the people of Israel. He never gave the command to anybody in the Bible except the people of Israel. And it was part of the covenant that he made with them when they came out of Egypt. That's what he said. Now, what is that covenant? According to Exodus 34, 28, it says, he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So the Ten Commandments are the words of the covenant. What covenant? The covenant that God made at Mount Sinai, of which he said the sign of that covenant for Israel was that they would keep the Sabbath. In Deuteronomy 4.13, it says, So he declared to you his covenant, the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone. Okay. He declared to you his covenant. What is that? The Ten Commandments. So the Ten Commandments are the covenant that God made with them at Mount Sinai that he had not made with their ancestors, only with them. You'll never read of anybody before the time of Moses nor after the time of Christ who has ever commanded to keep the Sabbath or any uh, of the covenant things that were about holy days or about uh, the festivals that were part of that covenant. That, the Sabbath was a weekly holy day. The Jews had many holy days, at least 70 per year, 52 Sabbaths or so. Then they had the, the 12 
new moons, which happened once a month. And then they had three annual festivals that had a Sabbath at the beginning and the end of each of those. That's six more. You've got at least 70 holy days that were treated like Sabbaths, some of them annual, some of them monthly, some of them weekly. And those were all part of the ceremonial law that God gave them at Mount Sinai. Now, there are a number of times in the passage we first read that says that this commandment is forever. But the word forever in the Old Testament, every time you find it, is the word olam in the Hebrew. Olam is used over 300 times in the Old Testament for future, at least 20 times of the past, and it means hidden or beyond the vanishing point or horizon. The basic meaning of olam, according to uh, Spiros Odiades in his uh, lexicon, is uh, most distant times, whether past or future. Therefore, the possible meanings of olam, it, it's a broad range between the remotest time and perpetuity. It can mean all, for all time, but it often doesn't mean for all time. The word olam is a broad meaning. It basically means beyond the vanishing point, beyond what we can see from here, for a very long time. Ad olam literally means as far as olam, or often translated forever. This definition agrees with all the Hebrew authorities. And uh, so the word olam really means something like for the duration, for the foreseeable future, indefinite future, a long period of time. So we see the term olam translated, for example, in Isaiah 42, 14. I've held my peace a long time. That's olam. I have been still and restrained myself. God didn't hold his peace forever, obviously, because he was talking about it right then. He was breaking the silence, but he has held his peace a long time. That's olam. In Jeremiah 2, 20, it says, for of old I have broken your yoke and burst your bonds, meaning when he let them out of Egypt. That was olam. That was from eternity past. Really? Only a few hundred years, really. Exodus 21, 6 says, his master shall pierce his ear with an awl and he shall serve him forever. This is the slave that's been offered freedom after seven years of service. He's now set free, uh, but he doesn't want to be free, so he gets his ear pierced and he's gonna be a slave forever. Really, into eternity? I think not. First Chronicles 17, 14 and 17, God said to Israel, actually he said to David, your son's throne shall be established forever. And David answered him and said, you have also spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come. A great while to come is how David understood olam, which is what it means. In Exodus 27, 21, Aaron's son shall tend the lamps from the evening to the morning, a statute forever to their generation. Well, that's just the same thing it said with the Sabbath, isn't it? It's a statute forever for Israel. Well, this is a statute forever for Aaron's sons. They'll tend the lamps in the tabernacle. Are they still doing that today? Exodus 29, 9, Aaron and his sons shall put their hats on them, and the priesthood shall be theirs for a perpetual statute. The word perpetual is olam in the Hebrew. So Aaron's sons are still priests today, apparently, except the New Testament says that they're not. In Exodus 30, in verse 8, it says, he shall burn incense on it, a perpetual, again, olam, incense before the Lord throughout your generations. That's precisely what he said in Exodus 31 about the Sabbath. You should keep the Sabbath throughout your generations forever. Same thing about burning incense in the tabernacle. Leviticus 16, 34, Yom Kippur shall be an everlasting, again, this is olam in the Hebrew, statute to you to make atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. This olam obviously doesn't always mean forever, does it? Especially when it's referring to laws that God gives them. Numbers 18, 19 says, the heave offerings I have given you and your sons and daughters with you as an ordinance forever. It is a covenant of salt forever with you and the des your descendants with you. Deuteronomy 23, 3 says, the Ammonite or the Moabite shall not enter the assembly of the Lord even to the 10th generation. None of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord forever. Was it the 10th generation or is it forever? Both. Because forever doesn't mean forever. It means a very long time. Sometimes it may refer to something forever. Sometimes not. Depends on context. But the laws that God gave to the Jews at Mount Sinai, they're always said to be forever and for all generations. Even burning incense, even the priest, even the Sabbath, all of them. Yom Kippur. And yet, they're not anymore. Because there's a new covenant now. There was a prediction made about Gehazi, the, the servant of Elisha, because of his line. He says, therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. Olam, 2 Kings 5, 27. 
Jonah 2.6, talking about his ordeal in the belly of the whale, which was three days long. He said, I went down to the moorings of the mountains, to the earth with its bars closed behind me for Olam, forever. Really? He was only three days in there. It's pretty short forever. You see, forever doesn't always mean forever. The Hebrew word Olam has a range of meaning. It means a long time. And it is applied to every law, almost, every ceremonial law you find in the Old Testament is said to be forever. But most of us don't believe most of them are. We don't offer animal sacrifices forever. How long was the law and the prophets supposed to be for? Jesus said in Luke 16, 16, the law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the kingdom of God has been preached. Now, what's the law and the prophets? It's the entire Tanakh, the entire Old Testament. The Jews call it the law and the prophets, the Torah and the prophets. The Ten Commandments are part of that, certainly. It's part of the Old Covenant. And Jesus said, yeah, the law and the prophets were until John. That sounds like it has a stopping point. Well, sure it does. Same as the rest of the laws that were given by Moses. Since then, something new has been preached, the kingdom of God. That's the gospel, the kingdom. Galatians 3.19, Paul said, what purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. The law was given for a while until the seed should come. If you read three verses earlier, he makes it very clear that seed is Christ. Christ came, and therefore the law was until then, until the seed came. Galatians 3, 23 through 25 says, but before the faith came, or before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith but after faith has come, we're no longer under the tutor. The law was given as a teacher, a tutor, to the people of Israel in a time that's comparable to childhood. The time of being under the law was a time comparable to spiritual childhood. But Jesus came and brought in spiritual completion. And we're no longer under the tutor. What is the tutor? The law. What is the Sabbath? It's part of the law. It's part of the Ten Commandments. Galatians 4, 1 through 5 says, Now I say that the heir, as long as a child, does not differ from a slave, though he is a master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the appointed time of the father. Even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. The, world, the word stoichia, elements here, means the ABCs, the, the basic things. The law here he's referring to is the ABCs of spirituality. We were kept under that when we were children. We we're in bondage under the basic stoicheia elements of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. We are kept under the ABCs, but we're redeemed from that now, that we might receive adoption as sons. So Paul says in Romans 10:4, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for all who believe. Anyone who says that we have to keep any of the laws of the Old Testament for righteousness is not recognizing Jesus for what Paul said he is, the end of the law for righteousness. Now there's a new covenant now. And in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. That's, of course, the Sinaitic covenant of which the Ten Commandments were a part. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. So instead of giving a law that is external, he's going to give a law that's written in the hearts. Now, Many of my Seventh-day Adventist friends say, well, what law do you think he wrote on the hearts? Isn't it the Old Testament law? No, it's a law that's not according to the old one. That's what he says. Notice the fourth line. This is a covenant that's not according to the covenant I made with their fathers. It's different. What's different about it? Oh, many things are different about it. Different priesthood. We don't have a priesthood of Aaron. We have a priesthood of Melchizedek now, forever. Different sacrifices, different temple, just about different everything because the ceremonies of the Old Covenant 
were types and shadows of things that are permanent in Christ. And therefore, the new covenant doesn't have the ceremonies anymore. It has the realities. It has not the shadows, but the substance. So in Hebrews 8.13, it says, in that he says a new covenant, he has made the first one obsolete. What's the first one? Well, you only have to read Hebrews to know that. He always refers to the covenant God made at Sinai with the law and the Ten Commandments as the first covenant. Well, the first one's what now? It's obsolete. He said there's a new covenant, and therefore there's not an old one anymore. It's obsolete. Now, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Why do you say it's ready to vanish away? Because he was writing before the temple fell, but not very much before. Although Jesus had ended the old covenant, the Jews didn't recognize it, and they continued to practice it until the temple was destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. That was about to end, but it was already obsolete. That's why it was going to end. The reason God was going to let the temple system be taken out in 70 AD by the Romans is because it was obsolete. God had no reason to keep it around. The writer's writing at that interim period where he says, well, it's obsolete now. It's about ready to disappear. In Mark 9, we have a very important story that's told four times in one way or another in the New Testament. Three of the Gospels and 2 Peter chapter 1 mentioned the transfiguration. Let me read it to you real quickly. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining exceedingly white like snow. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. But Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. Then a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. Suddenly, when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore but only Jesus with themselves. What's that about? Moses and Elijah represented the law and the prophets. The law came through Moses, according to John chapter 1 and every other place in the Bible that talks about it. The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The prophets, they were part of the Old Testament too. Now, M Moses represented the law, Elijah the prophets, and Jesus was there, and Peter didn't know the difference, so he didn't realize that Jesus wasn't just one of these guys. No, Jesus was not equal to them. Peter said, let's keep you all around. This is great, man, having Moses, Elijah, Jesus, and God didn't agree. God took Moses, Elijah away and left Jesus only there and said, this is who you're going to listen to now. Peter, James, and John had listened to the law and prophets all their lives. They were Jewish boys, Jewish men. They had always had to hearken to the law and the prophets. But God's saying, well, something's changed. This is my son. Hear him. Hebrews chapter 1 says, God, who had in sundry times and diverse manners spoken times past through the prophets, has spoken in these last days by his Son, who's the express image of his person and the bright shining of his glory. Christ is the final revelation, and the law and the prophets, thank you, the law and the prophets were a shadow of those things. And uh, so Paul says, clearly you are an epistle of Christ ministered by us, written by the Spirit of the living God not on tablets of stone. Oh, he's talking about the stone tablets, Ten Commandments, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. But if the ministry of death, he means the Old Covenant, written and engraved on stones, the Ten Commandments, or the ministry of death, he says, was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. What was passing away? The Old Covenant, the glory of the Old Covenant. It's described as a ministry of death written on stones. Can't be anything but the Ten Commandments. So what do we have now? We have Jesus instead. In Romans 7, 1 through 4, and I don't have time to read all this. Basically, he says we were married to the law in a covenant with the law. But the law, we've died to that. And now we're under a new covenant married to a new husband, one who was raised from the dead. So we now answer to Jesus, not to the law and the prophets. And I've run out of time, so I'll end right there. Thank you very much. You need that? Thank you, Steve. We're going to put 20 minutes on the clock and transition to Doug Batchelor. You let me know when to start. Uh, I'd like to just begin also by thanking, oh, okay. 
I'll use some of my time to say thank you everybody who helped organize this event. Thank you very much to Steve and Dana. We had a delightful lunch, uh, Karen Light, with them today. And I believe they're sincere Christian people. And I'm glad we can talk about this subject in this format. Um, now you're gonna have to restart my clock because my slides aren't up yet. <laughs> they're, they're switching that over. Boy, we've got a nice group. You all look so friendly. <laughs> you know, maybe you could start my clock. I'll let him put them up. I'll respond to some things that Steve said because we want to make the most of our time. And um, you just tell me when it started, and I'll go ahead. That must be a Mac. <laughs> it is. You can go ahead and start the clock, and when he gets the slides up, uh, you know, we'll go from there. And uh, I can maybe start out by responding to some things. Okay, my uh, clock started, and they're going to work out the technical difficulties with the slides. When I see it appear on the screen here, then I'll know. Um, yeah, I thank Steve for his thoughtful presentation. Uh, there's several things he said I would agree with. I agree that when you're talking about the word forever, uh, various times in the Bible, it's sometimes uh, nebulous. I also agree we're not under the Old Covenant now. I believe that we're under the New Covenant. And if you look there in Hebrews, you can look in Jeremiah chapter 31, 31. You can also look in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8, where he says he's making a new covenant. What is the issue with the New Covenant? Well, the covenant is made on better promises, and it's written on a different uh, substance. Old Covenant is written on stone. New Covenant is written on the heart. They're both the law of God. Um, the promises, the fault with the Old Covenant, God said finding fault with them in Hebrews chapter 8. The them is Israel. You remember when God gave the Ten Commandments and He proclaimed them from the mountaintop that um, the people said, all the Lord has said we will do. And then shortly after that they made a golden calf. They broke the covenant. They broke the promise. God says this new covenant is going to be based upon better promises. What are the better promises? It's a promise of God. God said, I will write my law in their heart. And so the covenant is based upon what God is promising. Now I believe that the, uh, the Sabbath is a whole different nature, the seventh day Sabbath, than you would find in the ceremonial Sabbath. And I agree that there's a lot of laws in the, uh, um, it looks like you're getting it working here. There's a lot of ceremonial laws that uh, do not apply. We're talking about the Ten Commandment. The Sabbath was instituted before there was sin. All right, I, I don't know if you'll be able to switch it to the screen. So my presentation, of course, is based upon is the Sabbath made for Christians? There we go. And uh, I believe that the Sabbath was established at creation. And uh, the reason for that is, let's just look at it here, Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it because in it he had rested from all the work that God created and did. So three times it says the seventh day, the seventh day, the seventh day. And I know we're not actually arguing about the Sabbath day, which day is the Sabbath here. I think Steve would freely admit that if you're going to keep a day, it's the seventh day. He's contesting that there really is no Sabbath right now. Um, but look at what happened. God makes the whole world in six days. How many days in a week? Seven. Why? Because God now makes one more day and he does it after he makes man and he blesses the day, he hallows the day, he sanctifies this day. The idea that man was not aware of it. Now man is made in God's image and this is a day that God has declared holy. It's not like man is going to go up and say, God, on the seventh day, I want to talk to you. God said, don't bother me, I'm resting. Um, the Sabbath day was made for this world. Adam was given dominion of the world and it's something that man was supposed to participate in from the very beginning. And when you think about the creation, who is the creator? 
The Bible says all things that were made were made by him. Who's that? That's Jesus. Isn't that right? He is the living word. He made all things. He's the one who wrote the Ten Commandments. All things that were made were made by him. So we don't have Jesus at odds with the Ten Commandments. And if you look here in Exodus 20, verse 8, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you should labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. You'll notice the word Sabbath is three times in this commandment. Now, by the way, the longest of the Ten Commandments, it's in the middle of the Ten Commandments. It is the only commandment that begins with the word remember, and many are saying it's the only one we're supposed to forget. Because nobody here really believes, if you look at the commandments before the Sabbath and after the Sabbath, do born-again New Testament, New Covenant Christians honor their mother and father? Are we supposed to not kill and not lie and not steal and not take God's name in vain? Pick your other nine commandments. Nobody has a problem with those being part of the ongoing Christian life. Why would we take the one in the middle that God says, now don't forget this, and say that's the only one you're really supposed to forget? And, and by the way, it ties the commandments between God to the commandments with man. It not only says that you're supposed to rest on the seventh day, it says you're supposed to work and it's supposed to let your, your uh, slave and your animals, your son and your daughter, and even the stranger within your gates, foreigners, are to observe it. Anyone within your territory. Uh, get back to the commandment here. And it says, you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your cattle or the stranger within your gates. And then he tells why. He points back to the creation when God established the Sabbath day. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and he rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and he hallowed it. And the Bible says in Chronicles 17, 27, For you have blessed, O Lord, and it will be blessed forever. And Jesus said, It's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. So is the Sabbath rest only for Israelites? I say no. Uh, is it only Israelites that need a day of rest? Is it only Jewish slaves that need to rest? I mean, do we as Christians believe a person should work seven days a week, 365 days a year? Sabbath's very practical. It's a moral law as well as a spiritual law. Jesus said, Mark 2, 27, he said the Sabbath was made for man. The word there, man, is anthropos, and that means humanity. You know what else was made for man in the Garden of Eden? The woman. Do we still need women? then we still need the sacred day of rest. And so um, I believe that the Sabbath is it's an eternal institution. God makes this before there's sin. The ceremonial Sabbaths, and there are many of them, they all come as a result of sin. Part of God's perfect plan, the very beginning of his perfect institution, included the Sabbath day. And the reason he says man was not made for the Sabbath is because God first makes man, then he makes the Sabbath to be a blessing for man. He doesn't make the Sabbath and then tell man you're to serve it. The Sabbath is to be made as a blessing for man, for humanity. All right. Are we still on? And he goes on, he says, in Isaiah 56, verse 6 and 7, also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him, to love the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and takes hold of my covenant. He's talking about non-Jews here. It says, even them I'll bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. For my house of prayer shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Boy, that's just as small for you as it is for me. Something happened when they converted that. <laughs> uh, it, it, now, you say, well, but it, it was for the Jews. Because we have these verses like Exodus 31, Steve just quoted. It says, it's a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth. Well, did he only make the heaven and the earth for Jews? Or is that something that points back for all humanity? Something else you should notice there. If you look in the Ten Commandments, when God first gives the Ten Commandments, He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Now what's He referencing? The Exodus for the children of Israel. He says, you're to have no other gods before me. Now are we going to say that because God connects the first commandment with Israel, that that commandment doesn't apply because it's a Jewish commandment? I think everyone agrees, no, that first commandment is for all New Testament, New Covenant Christians. Do only Jews need to work six days? Do only Jews and Jewish slaves and Jewish animals need to rest? 
See, that's part of the commandment. We always talk about the resting part but, uh, and the keeping it holy and not working, but it was a day to also make sure they remembered to let their servants rest. That's why when Moses repeats the Sabbath commandment in Deuteronomy chapter 5, he says, don't forget you are slaves. He's saying, make sure and let your servants and let your animals rest. Don't forget you are a slave. So it's not just about keeping the day holy, it's about resting too. Um, now, just, I just threw this in for context. Uh, if you look at Martin Luther, John Wesley, John Whitecliffe, William Tyndale, Charles Spurgeon, John Calvey, Dwight Moody, Billy Graham, all believe what I'm telling you, that the Sabbath was established in the Garden of Eden and it is still part of the Ten Commandments. The New Covenant is that law written on the heart. So this is not, you know, this is a pretty orthodox point of view. Jesus and the apostles kept the Sabbath and Gentile Christians did. Let's look at this real quick. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. It doesn't say he's keeping the Jewish Sabbath. It's his custom to obey the commandments of God. You can also read about Paul. And Paul, as his custom was, he went unto them three Sabbath days and reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Um, and it says he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath day and persuaded Jews and Greeks. So now it's not just Jews. He's not just going to the synagogue to talk to Jews, Jews and Greeks. If you look in Acts 13, and when the Jews are gone out, okay, the Jews are gone now. It says they went out of the synagogue. The Gentiles besought these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now we got Gentiles coming, and listen. It says on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. And the whole city, the Gentiles came together. The apostles met, and someone counted it up once, and there were, you know, like 50 Sabbaths in the Acts of the Apostles when you add up the years that the apostles were meeting, and never did they say it was done away with. Acts 16, 13, Luke, who's a Gentile, writing to Theophilus, who's a Gentile, and he says, uh, on the Sabbath day we went out of the city to a riverside where prayer was customarily made. Just states it as a matter of fact. Luke mentions the Sabbath many times in his gospel. He never says the Jewish Sabbath. In fact the Sabbath is mentioned 172 times in the Bible. It would have been so easy for God to say you don't need to keep the Sabbath anymore. Look at what God does when he gives the Sabbath. On a mountain, burning with fire, don't touch it, voice of God, writes it with his own hand, writes it in stone to represent its unchanging nature. All the other Ten Commandments we probably all agree on. But it's this one that's become a point of contention. I think that it's still in effect. Did Jesus intend his people to keep the Sabbath after the cross? Matthew 24, he's talking about the end of time. He says, he that endures to the end. The disciples say, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the world? And in that discourse he says, pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Just states it as a fact. So have the Ten Commandments been changed or abrogated? <coughs> Obviously I think not. I think the New Covenant is God writing that law in love on our hearts. Ten Commandments are summarized in love. First four commandments deal with love and worship for God. Last six commandments deal with love for your fellow man. You've got this love relationship and this love relationship. And that's the New Covenant. It's through love we do it. And so when I'm talking about the Sabbath, Nobody's saved by keeping the Sabbath. Nobody's saved by any law. The question is, if you love him, do you want to keep those laws? Why wouldn't you? It wasn't created to be a burden for man. It was created to be a blessing. So have the Ten Commandments been changed? Jesus said, do not think that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy but fulfill. What does fulfill mean? Let the Bible interpret itself. Jesus comes to John the Baptist John says, oh no, you need to baptize me. Jesus said, suffer it to be so now, for thus it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness. Does that mean do away with all righteousness? So when he said, don't think that I've come to destroy the law, I didn't come to destroy but to fulfill. He kept it in his life. He lived a perfect life. Jesus never sinned. That's why we have, I have to keep stopping myself from saying amen. <laughs> That's why we have hope, is because he was holy. And so fulfill doesn't mean do away with, otherwise John the Baptist or Jesus would have said to John to do away with all righteousness. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments and teach men so, he'll be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. 
And so I think we should be doing and teaching them. Um, the beast power mentioned in Daniel 7.25, we're told that he will think to change times and laws. It's interesting, there's only one time and law in the Ten Commandments, and that would be the Sabbath. Um, rich young ruler came to Jesus, said, Good master, what good things should I do to have everlasting life? And the Lord says, Why do you call me good? There's no one good but one, and that is God. This is found in Matthew 19, Mark chapter 9. And he said, If you would enter into life, keep the commandments. And he says, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. There were hundreds of Jewish laws. There were ceremonial laws and there were civil laws and there were health laws. He could have quoted any of those. Jesus goes right to the heart of the new covenant and he mentions the laws that deal with man's relationship with his fellow man. Now he doesn't say, don't worship idols, don't take my name in vain, don't keep the Sabbath and it's okay to have other gods. He doesn't mention that I think because the young men interrupted him. But um, <laughs> it doesn't mean it's okay to break those now. Idolatry is not okay. Number six, does breaking one commandment really matter to God? James chapter 2, whoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Now listen to what James says next. For he that said, do not commit adultery, what section of law is that? It's Ten Commandments. Said also, do not murder. Now if you don't commit adultery but you murder, you are a transgressor of the law. And he says in James 2.12, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. He says it's something you'll be judged by. James quotes from two of the Ten Commandments. What is that law of liberty? Psalm 119 verse 44 and 45 says, so I will keep your commandments forever and ever and I will walk at liberty. The commandments aren't bondage. The commandments in the heart are liberty because I seek your precepts. So does the Sabbath, did it exist before Mount Sinai? Remember Moses and Aaron, they go to the Pharaoh. First they meet with the elders of Israel and they said God is going to visit you. And then they go to the Pharaoh and say let our people go. And the Pharaoh says I hear you've been talking to them and you're making them rest. Look at the verse here, Exodus 5, 5. Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are many, and you are making them rest. The word there is Sabbath. You are making them Shabbat. Because Moses had said, Look, God's going to deliver you. You need to put God first. Well, they started resting again on the Sabbath because they neglected it during their captivity. And uh, first thing that happens, they get out of Egypt. They're not at Mount Sinai yet. Ten commandments are not written. God rains down bread six days a week. They get twice as much on Friday or the sixth day, none on Sabbath. When they didn't trust the Lord and they went out looking for the manna on the Sabbath, they listened to what God says. How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? Now why is he saying how long will you refuse if this was the first time they disobeyed it? And where had he declared it to them? So they evidently had known about this for years before. In fact, if you look in Genesis chapter 26 verse 5, speaking of Abraham, this is prior to Exodus, he says, Abraham kept my charge, my statutes, my commandments, my laws. So there was law way back even then. It's not just circumcision. So Exodus 16 is the manna, Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments. Does the Bible teach that God's end time people would also be keeping the seventh day holy? I believe the answer is yes. It says the dragon hates those that keep the commandments of God and faith of Jesus. Um, in Revelation 14, the message that goes to the world, it says, Worship him that made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of waters. That is at least in part an excerpt from the Sabbath commandment. It's calling us back to worship the Creator, which it is a sign of. It says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus in Revelation 14, 12. Last chapter in the Bible. Blessed are those that do his commandments that they might have a right to the tree of life and might enter in through the gates of the city. And so I, even in heaven, Isaiah 66, for as the new heavens and the new earth that I will make will remain before me, says the Lord, so will your seed and your name remain. And it will come to pass that from one new moon to another and one Sabbath to another shall all flesh, not just Jews, come to worship before me. So there's an act of coming to worship before God on the Sabbath that he creates back in the Garden of Eden. So you see it all the way through the Bible from Adam to Moses, Jesus, the apostles, and I think it's still there today. 105 languages of the world. The word for the seventh day is Sabbath. Subota, Russian, Sabado, Spanish, so forth. 
What blessings are promised by keeping the Sabbath commandment? Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's about resting in Jesus. Yes, we have the spirit of the law, but you don't neglect the letter. He says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. It's a blessing. It's not a curse. He said, if you love me, thank you, if you love me, keep my commandments. The commandments of Jesus are not different from the ten. I showed you where he quoted them to other people. And so um, what are the reasons for keeping the Sabbath? Well, for one thing, it's a time for corporate worship. It's a time for physical rest. It's a memorial of creation. I had some other things that are, they've been deleted by the <laughs> computer <laughs> from the, uh, it's a memorial of creation. It's a memorial of redemption, Exodus chapter 31. Uh, I don't have time to go into some of my common arguments. Tell you what, I'll just reserve that and I'll, I'll donate 24 minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs> 24 seconds. All right. Thank you, Steve. And Doug, before uh, Steve, you respond, we're just going to ask if you've written down a question. Now would be the time to turn it in. So if you've written down a question, we're going to ask our ushers if you would pass the question to the side. That'll probably make it a little easier. We'll have our ushers come down and they will collect the cards. And if somebody misses you and you want to turn your card in, just wave it in the air. I think we have, do we have any cards on this side that need to be picked up? You can just raise it if they don't pick it up coming down. And once the card is received, bring it up to the front here and that'll be part of our question and answer time. The next segment will be 10 minute response from uh, each of the presenters. So Steve will go first and we'll tell you when it begins. We're just going to take one moment to make sure we can eliminate that feedback on the mic. Is this yeah, I think it might be. Go ahead and speak, and we'll just Testing. see if we can Testing. keep going. Testing. All right, we're going to give that a try. So we're going to start the 10 minutes right now. We'll tell you when. Okay, Steve, the 10 minutes starts now. All right. Now, I'm not to use this 10 minutes to further advance my case, but to respond to Doug's points. This is called a rebuttal uh, response. So I can't develop my case anymore tonight, uh, but I can speak to some of the issues that Doug brought up. Probably not all of them. I only have 10 minutes. The main thing that I think Doug pointed out is that he believed the Sabbath was made for all men, was instituted before sin, before Israel was founded as a nation, and will continue, it does continue from the time of Christ and into the present time and into the end times, even into the new heavens, new earth. This is apparently Doug's thesis. And I would like to just suggest that I don't believe any of the scriptures that were brought up mean that. I don't have time to exegete all those scriptures in this 10 minute period. Though, by the way, I'm having a follow up on this tomorrow afternoon. You can find out about it if you're interested uh, in another location. But uh, let's start with the suggestion that the, the Sabbath was instituted before sin. Well, he read a verse that I even quoted at the beginning of my presentation. God rested on the seventh day and he sanctified it and blessed it. That's great, excellent. If you can find a reference in there to telling people to do anything unusual on the Sabbath day, you're welcome to do it. I find none. When we execute scripture, we're not allowed to bring in things that we want to be there if we really want to understand it. We have to say what is there, what can we draw from it, what has God revealed? not what can we bring back from later passages. God rested on the seventh day and that made it different than other days, holy, unique. And later, he commanded Israel to observe that. Now, he said that in Exodus 5.5, 5, Moses was making the people to Sabbath, to Shabbat, it says in the Hebrew. Uh, Pharaoh was saying, you make the people rest from their labors. Yeah, he was, he's making them not be zealous slaves. He's not talking about anything they're doing on the seventh day. Pharaoh was upset because they weren't working zealously because they had a hope of being delivered. They, they were not being faithful slaves. They were in rebellion because Moses was leading them into rebellion. The same word Shabbat occurs 71 times in the Old Testament. Only 13 of those times are talking about the Sabbath observance. It's the ordinary word for cease. In what God said, or what Pharaoh says, you're making the people to cease from their works. Yes, he was. He's delivering them from slavery, in fact. But out of 71 times that this word Shabbat appears in the Old Testament, 
only 13 times refers to keeping the Sabbath. The rest have to do with things like Genesis 8:22, Summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Shabbat. Jeremiah 31, 36, then the seed of Israel shall cease Shabbat from being a nation. Job 32, 1, these three men ceased Shabbat to answer Job, and so forth. It's the normal word for ceasing. It's not a special word for Sabbath keeping. Although it sounds like Sabbath, that's why it does, because the word Sabbath means cease also. But the point here is that this is not a, a reference to keeping the Sabbath. There's at least no reason to believe that it is. Um, the suggestion was made that because the Sabbath is in the middle of the Ten Commandments and the longest, uh, and it, it's, insigni its significance is great, and we shouldn't think that we can neglect the other Nine Commandments. Well, uh, what I pointed out to you in the first session is that the Ten Commandments, according to the Scripture, were the Old Covenant. They were the words of the covenant that God gave them at Sinai, and that covenant has passed. It was 2 Corinthians 3 that said the law written on stone was fading away. It, the glory of it was fading. Uh, I didn't make that up. I'm not a, I, I don't make these things up. I, I have to find out what's there, and I don't like to add things to them. Did Jesus quote some of the Ten Commandments? Of course, he was speaking to Jews. He said it was good for the Pharisees that they had kept, paid their tithes. He even told his disciples in Matthew chapter 5, when you go to the, uh, the temple to offer your sacrifice, if you remember someone has something against you, go fix it and then go offer your sacrifice. He's talking to people under the law, and of course they were obligated to keep the law. They were, the new covenant had not come yet. The new covenant was instituted in the upper room when Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Before that, everybody in Israel, including everyone that Jesus spoke to, including his disciples, were Jews under the old covenant. And when the rich young ruler said, you know, what should I do? What laws? Jesus quoted some from the Old Testament, but not only the Ten Commandments, the passage in Matthew 19 that Doug quoted actually doesn't just have Ten Commandments. The last commandment Jesus told him is love your neighbors, you love yourself, which is from Leviticus, not the Ten Commandments. So Jesus didn't just quote the Ten Commandments, they keep the Ten Commandments. He said, you're under the law, you should be keeping the commandments, all the commandments. Here's some important ones. Certainly many of the Ten Commandments embodied moral principles that existed before and after the law was given. The laws of Hammurabi, the, the Babylonian had most of the moral laws of Moses in it too. It's pagan law. Most countries that don't acknowledge God at all have laws against murder and against stealing and against treason and things like that, which is what those laws actually amounted to in the Ten Commandments too. God says, I'm making you my nation. Here's things I'm insisting upon. While you're under this covenant, these ten things are going to have to be. Now Jesus came and he made a new covenant and it's still important not to kill or commit adultery or steal or bear false witness. That's, that's wrong no matter what time you live in. But Sabbath keeping was a unique command given to Israel and God said so. He said it would be a sign of his covenant with Israel. How could it be a sign between himself and Israel if he expected other people to keep it too? Israel keeping it wouldn't be unique. He said you're my holy people, this is holy to you. Holy means unique, set apart. If God wanted Israel to have specifically a sign between himself and them as a separate, unique people, and he said it's Sabbath keeping, then that'd spoil everything if other people kept the Sabbath because then it wouldn't be a unique sign. It wouldn't be a sign of Israel at all. Now, Jesus did say it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one jot or tittle of the law to fail. I don't believe the law failed. I believe it fulfilled its purpose. You see, Paul compared it to a child becoming a man. It, we read it in Galatians in my presentation. What did Paul say? We were under the law when we were children. Now we're men. We're, we're adults. You see, when a little boy grows up, the little boy isn't there anymore. There's a man instead. But he hasn't been destroyed. He's been fulfilled. The growing up to maturity is not a destruction of the child. It's the fulfillment of what the child's very presence anticipated. And the law anticipated Christ. Christ did come and he did fulfill the law. And sure, sometimes the word fulfill can refer to keeping it. I don't doubt that Jesus kept the law much of the time, although the Bible does speak of some laws that he, that he broke. He, uh, he let himself be touched by a leper uh, or, or by a woman with an issue of blood or by um, other people that were unclean. Jesus didn't really keep the laws down to the last drop because he was the Lord of those laws. He said he was the Lord of the Sabbath day. 
He said that when he was defending his disciples because they weren't keeping the Sabbath. The Pharisees criticized them for it. Now some people say, well, they were keeping the Sabbath, they just weren't keeping the Pharisees' ideas about the Sabbath. No, Jesus said that what they were doing was like David eating the showbread. That was breaking a law of God. In fact, it, Jesus even said in Matthew 12, David ate and it was not lawful for him to eat it. Like my disciples are doing something that's not lawful to do on the Sabbath, David did something that was not lawful to do and you don't criticize him. Then he says that the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath every Sabbath and they're guiltless. What do you mean pro they profane it? They work the same work on the Sabbath as any other day. That's what you're not supposed to do on the Sabbath. The command is do your work six days and don't do it on the seventh day. Jesus said the priests in the temple, they continually profane the Sabbath. They treat it like any other day. He said, but they're blameless. Apparently keeping the Sabbath isn't absolute. And then Jesus said, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath day. It's true in Mark's parallel of that. He says the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Uh, Douglas and all Seventh-day Adventists I've talked to believe that means it's for all mankind. Well, that could be Jesus' point if he was arguing with people who thought it wasn't or if he, if, if he was arguing over that issue. What Jesus was pointing out is they were using the Sabbath to hinder man from meeting his needs when he's hungry and so forth. A man with a withered arm. They wanted him to remain that way on the Sabbath. They were bringing man into bondage to the Sabbath. And Doug even said this. And Doug even acknowledged this. He was saying the Sabbath was to be a blessing to man, not man a blessing to the Sabbath. But when he said the Sabbath was made for man, he doesn't mean mankind. He wasn't debating that point. No one in the discussion was saying, I think it's for our mankind. No, I think it's just for the Jews. And she said, I'm going to settle that. It's for all mankind. The word anthropos means man. It means mankind. It means it, it's as flexible as our earthly, I mean, our English word, uh, man. <clears throat> and, and therefore, uh, it's, he's not making a point about it being for all men on the world. Jesus knew better. He knew the law. It was given to Israel. It was never given to anybody else in the Bible, we never read of it being given to anybody else. When it comes to the eschatology part and Paul and Jesus keeping Sabbath, we don't know that they kept Sabbath. They went in the Sabbath. They went in the synagogue on Sabbath. <coughs> no law in the Old Testament says to go to the synagogue on Sabbath. And what they did there was what they did every day. They preached. They preached outside the synagogue on other days. They preached in the synagogue on Sabbath. That's not keeping the Sabbath. In fact, if anything, that's breaking the Sabbath the same way that priests do when they profane the Sabbath. They do the same work every day. I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. All right. Welcome up, Doug, to have a 10-minute response. We'll, we will tell you when shortly. And your 10-minute time starts now. All right. I'm going to see if I can return to my screen, if that's okay, because I, I stopped a little short of that. Um, some of the common arguments that are often given in regard to the Sabbath day is found in Romans chapter 14. Well, you may as well just read that out of your Bible. <laughs> uh, you, it'll, it'll be better on your phone <laughs> than you've got there. I'm sorry, I got a problem with my mic here. He says here in Romans chapter 14, um, you're out of verse 5. One man esteems one day above another. Another man esteems every day alike. Let everyone be fully convinced in his own mind. He that observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he that does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, and he who gives, and he gives God thanks. He who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat, and he does not give God thanks. You know, it's often true people turn to Galatians or Romans to try to say we don't need to keep the law, but if you look carefully, the word Sabbath does not appear in the whole book of Romans. The word Sabbath does not appear in the book of Galatians. Peter says in 2 uh, Peter chapter 3 that some people take the writings of Paul and they can twist them to their own destruction and they're carried away with the error of the lawless. So you've got to be careful not to read into what Paul says something he doesn't mean. Um, for example, here it's talking about feast days and fast days. The word that you find 15 times in Romans 14, 15 times it talks about eat. Sabbath, zero. They're talking about when you could eat, when you couldn't eat. They not only had, um, they had annual days, they had monthly Sabbath days, and they had weekly fast days. 
And you can also find reference to that in the, the Didache and some other early documents. You remember where the Pharisees said, oh, I fast twice a week and I pay tithe of all that I got. The disciples came to Jesus and said, how come John's disciples fast and your disciples don't fast? Days of fasting was a big argument back then. There was no argument about keeping the Sabbath. You know, in our Constitution it says we hold these truths to be self-evident. There in Genesis when God establishes the Sabbath day and he blesses the Sabbath day and he makes it holy and it's part of his perfect plan, it was a self-evident truth for God's people. Was it given to Israel? Yes. And he says, I have called them to be a nation of kings and priests and he wanted them to be a light to the world. He was calling everybody to Israel. Let's go real quick and look at uh, Hebrews. Look at the New Covenant. That's sort of our theme for the night. Hebrews 8. Paul here, assuming he wrote Hebrews, is quoting from Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 8. Because finding fault with them, he's talking about the, the Jewish fathers that had made the promise, they made the covenant. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Now, I would think just about everybody here agrees we are all saved under the new covenant. Listen to who the new covenant is made with. I will make a new covenant after those days with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The new covenant first appears in the Old Testament. The idea of the law being written on our hearts, he talked about circumcising your heart. He wanted to write the law on our hearts. He commands us to love him and obey. That's how Moses, matter of fact in the Ten Commandments, uh, when he talks about the uh, idolatry showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. The reason to keep his commandments is because we love him. And uh, Jesus is not at odds with uh, God the Father. They all supported the Sabbath day. So he says, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. How do any Gentiles get saved? Paul says in Romans, we are grafted into the stock of Israel. We're all reading a Hebrew Bible. We become spiritual Jews. Not that I don't think God still has something special for the Jews because I am half Jewish. But I, I think that uh, we must not forget that if you are Christ then you are Abraham's seed. And so we can't, we can't drop a big veil between the Sabbath and Israel and Christians. I think that it's something for everybody. Uh, one of the Ten Commandments he says to remember. Um, when I called them out of the land of Egypt because they did not continue in my covenant, he says they broke it. I disregarded them, says the Lord. This is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel. Who is the house of Israel? He is not a Jew who is one outwardly. He is a Jew who is one inwardly. And he makes a covenant and he puts his laws in their heart. Now, I just, in the area where Steve and I would disagree, and again, I think he's a wonderful Christian gentleman, is I think the Sabbath is part of the Ten Commandments. I see God doing something distinctly different with the Ten Commandments. It was different from the ceremonial laws and the way he delivered them. He spoke those. Moses wrote the other laws. You look in Deuteronomy chapter, uh, chapter 4 verse 13 and he said, I delivered unto them my covenant which I commanded them to perform, even Ten Commandments, and at that time I gave Moses statutes and judgments. God makes a distinction. He made a distinction in the way he spoke it. He made a distinction in the way he wrote it. He made a distinction in how it was housed. The other laws were put on scroll. They were put on the outside of the ark. Ten commandments in the middle of the ark. You know, and the only time you find the word holy in the entire Ten Commandments is in the Sabbath commandment. I think we've got to be very careful. God is calling us to be a holy people, a set aside people. And where is the danger in keeping the Sabbath day? Where's the harm? Well, Pastor Doug, we might have a problem. Might Look at what the apostles did and others did where they stood up for the law. Daniel said, I'm not going to break the first commandment and pray to King Darius. Shadrach, Meshach, and he went to the lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we're not going to bow down and worship idols. God honored them in the fiery furnace. And in the last days, the beast power is going to force people to break one of the commandments, to worship an image. So if God's people are fuzzy about the Ten Commandments, I think that's very dangerous in the last days. He wants to write it in your heart. And so I think the Sabbath is part of that. Um, then of course you've got Colossians chapter 2 is another verse that um, people often go to when they're worried about, you know, the Sabbath because you do find where it says in verse 16, and uh, let's see here, so let no one judge you in food or in drink 
regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow. You notice it doesn't say Sabbaths, period. Don't let them judge you regarding new moons or Sabbaths, comma, which are. He's telling what kind of Sabbath? A shadow. How is the Sabbath made before there was sin a shadow? There was no sin. All the other Sabbaths came 2,400 years later pointing forward to the cross and all the annual feasts and the jubilee every seven years and the, with the farming and every 49 years with the jubilee. It's all pointing to the, uh, the sacrifice of Christ and there's spiritual analogies there. But do we need physical rest? Is it only Jews that need a day of physical rest? Is it only Jews that are not to overwork their employees or their animals? And so the Sabbath, I think, is a moral commandment that is right in there with the best of them. And even if you have doubts, Jesus said, look at the law. Whosoever therefore shall think to break one of the least of these commandments and teach others so, he will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do them and teach them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And so I see that Jesus is uh, still making a priority out of that. I'm going to stop uh, two minutes early. And so I want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions to come in. All right. Thank you, Pastor Doug. The way the next uh, portion is going to go, uh, there are two minutes allotted for each question. So we will ask a question first to Steve. He'll have two minutes to respond. And then following, oh, Doug yeah. will have one minute to respond to the same question and then we'll switch it around. But just before we start the timer, we had a very important question that came in, and Chris needs to read this one so everyone can hear it. Yes, uh, in fact, there was um, two very important questions that we figured we'd cover within the two minutes that were generously given to us by uh, Doug. The first question was, did, and this was to, both of these were actually directed to Steve Gregg, because they're uh, expecting that he would somehow know this. Um, did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? <laughs> no. <laughs> because a belly button is not a body part, it's a scar from an operation, and they had never had that operation. Nice, <laughs> nice, well said. Okay, and the second question, was Jesus left-handed? I can't say. The sheep are on his right hand. So, <laughs> they're closer. That's probably correct. <laughs> All right, at this time we're going to begin with uh, the questions in earnest. We've got two minutes. Um, Chris is going to read the first question. It's directed to Steve. And then we will let you know, Doug, when we have a one-minute response to that same question. Go ahead and read the question, then we'll start the question. Okay, so we had, I just want to say real quick, we had a ton of questions, most of which would have a heck of a time covering in two minutes. All of these would be, but many of them were very redundant, so we tried to pick the, the top three uh, for each. These, this question was asked by many, and that is, um, Steve Gregg, do you worship on Sunday? If so, why? I don't worship on Sunday any more than any other day. The early church didn't either. In the book of Acts, it says they met daily and continued in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking bread and prayers. Uh, all days were alike. Doug made reference to Romans 14.5. I didn't because we didn't have time to get into it, but it mentions one man esteems one day above another. Another man esteems every day alike. Now, one might say, well, one day, the man who keeps one day above another is not talking about the weekly Sabbath. Well, if someone's keeping every day alike, they're not observing a weekly Sabbath. It's the antithesis of keeping a Sabbath, is that you keep every day alike. And that's what Paul said that some were doing. He says everyone could be persuaded in their own mind. And that's what I do. I believe we're supposed to worship God all the time. In Hebrews chapter 13, it says, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise unto God, uh, even giving thanks to his name. There's not one day above another to worship God because we're supposed to worship God every day. And for me to worship God more on one day than another means I have to uh, worship him less on those other days. By the way, the Sabbath command in Exodus chapter 20 did not include going to church. If the laws that Moses wrote, other than the Ten Commandments, are not binding as much as the Ten Commandments, then going to church on Sabbath is not. Because there's no Sabbath command to go to church except in the books of Moses, 
not in the Ten Commandments. So, no, I, I sometimes go to church on Sunday. I have, I have meetings on many nights of the week. I, I'll be teaching twice a day the next week, every day of the week, and that's pretty much my style. I don't really have certain days that are more important than others. I'll let him restart the clock. Okay, Doug, you have one minute for your response. It starts now. Well, I do believe that uh, God specifies that there is a particular day to come before him and worship. If you look in Leviticus chapter 23 in the first few verses, he sets aside the Sabbath command as distinct from the other annual feasts, and he calls it a holy convocation. The word convocation is kind of like it sounds. It means an assembly, a coming together. We just quoted from Isaiah chapter 66 where he said that from one Sabbath to another all flesh will come and worship before him. And then you find the pattern of Jesus and Paul. It says as their custom was. Custom isn't something that you do once or twice. Custom is a pattern. They entered into the synagogue. The word synagogue means the gathering. And they read the scriptures. Now I think we can study the Bible all the time. And I think we should worship God every day. We're not contending that. But if you do what the Sabbath says every day, you're not holy, you're lazy. Because it's telling you to rest and not to do any kind of work and treat it in a, a special way. Time's up. And <laughs> the next question we have is directed to Doug. And I'll read the question, then we'll start the clock. It says... Uh, what is the difference between the ceremonial law and the Ten Commandments and which law was nailed to the cross according to Paul? Time starts now. Well, I think there's a, a vast difference between the ceremonial laws. You look in Acts chapter 15 and there was a big dispute among the early Christians about what they were supposed to give to the Gentile believers. And uh, they had to have a whole Jerusalem council to discuss that. And in the Jerusalem Council, there were a few points that were of interest. The one was uh, eating blood, eating things sacrificed to idols, uh, fornication, and immorality. Um, and so, you know, Paul spent a lot of time in Galatians dealing with that. He said, you're, you're having them put these ceremonial laws on you that are not put on God's people. Now, if you look in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and I believe it's verse 19, he says, circumcision is nothing, uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments is what matters. And so circumcision was part of the ceremonial law. The annual Sabbaths were part of the ceremonial law. Anything that had to do with the, the, uh, the sanctuary and its services, the Sabbath was kept before there ever was a sanctuary. Uh, you have the Sabbath being kept in Exodus before they built the temple. But when Jesus died on the cross, the veil was rent. We have a new temple now. You and I are the temple of God. We have a new priesthood. We are uh, priests of God in that respect. And so, um, yeah, I think that the ceremonial laws are part of what was nailed to the cross. Uh, we're no longer obligated to keep um, the annual feast days or circumcision. And 30 seconds. There were several annual feasts. You had the Passover. You had the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, a Feast of Tabernacles. All these came after sin. Whereas the Sabbath of the Ten Commandments was created in the Garden of Eden, part of God's perfect plan when everything was a paradise, be part of his perfect plan in uh, eternity, and um, even in heaven. We're going to build houses and inhabit them, plant vineyards and eat the fruit, but we will come together to worship before the Lord on the Sabbath. Time's according up. According to Isaiah. All right, I might just say that I would define ceremonial laws as... Oh, one, one second. Oh, okay. All right. Your time officially starts now. <laughs> I define moral laws as those that are rooted in the character of God. Justice, mercy, faithfulness. These are the character of God and all laws that reflect that, like don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't dishonor your parents. Those are moral laws because they are rooted in faithfulness and justice and mercy and the other things that are part of the character of God. Ceremonial laws are those which point forward to something greater than themselves that were part of a system which could have been different if God wished. God could have had people rest on the third day and the fourth day and the seventh day if he wished. And it wouldn't have broken anything in his character to do that. So anything uh, ceremonial is symbolic or it reminds us of something or it looks forward to something. But what is rooted in the character of God and unchangeable is a moral law. 
and that's where I would see the difference. Okay, this question is for Steve. You'll have two minutes to respond and we will tell you the time. The question is, what does God mean when he says to have the law written on our heart? I believe a reference to Jeremiah 31. Time starts now. What he means is that he's gonna give a new heart. He also says in Ezekiel chapter 36, I'm gonna take out the heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh. This new heart is characterized by the fruit of the Spirit, which is love. And therefore, everything that is loving to your neighbor and to God, anything that love itself would dictate without separate laws to dictate them, will be that which is built into our hearts. The Holy Spirit leads us into, well, Paul said the fruit of the Spirit. And he, after he gave a list of the things that are the fruit of the Spirit, he said, against these there's no law. In other words, if you're walking in the Spirit, he says, if you're under, walking in the Spirit, you're not under the law, Paul said in Galatians. Uh, but, but that's because if you're walking in the Spirit, you love God, you love people, that's the fruit of the Spirit, and the laws that you cannot violate in love toward God or toward people are the laws that God has written on our hearts by writing love on our hearts. He's put his love in our hearts. Paul said in Romans 5.2, that the, or five, uh, five, excuse me, that the love of God is poured forth into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. So the writing his law in the hearts is, is really what comes from having his spirit live within us, giving us guidance and changing our orientation that we love one another, we love God, and we don't have an external code that's imposed upon us in addition to that. Okay, Doug, you have a, a one-minute response. That time starts now. Well, I believe that uh, the law written on the heart is when God puts his law through the Holy Spirit in our minds, the great commandments, love the Lord with all your heart, love your neighbor. The Ten Commandments are a summary of that. First four commandments deal with love for God. The last six commandments deal with love for your fellow man. When you have the love of God shed abroad in your heart, it doesn't mean you no longer need any specific instruction on how to please him. Paul says we should study how to please him. Moses says these words I've commanded you shall be in your heart. What words? He had just given them the Ten Commandments. And he, that's the great Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. These words I've commanded shall be in your heart. Teach them diligently to your children. That would mean including idolatry, not taking God's name in vain, the Sabbath, there's instruction that goes with it. It doesn't mean you love less. It means you love better. All right, we'll prepare for the next question. All right, the question is, directed to Pastor Doug, how do you interpret Matthew 12, verse 8, when Jesus calls himself the Lord of the Sabbath? Your time starts now. Well, let me find it first here. <laughs> well, of course, we just read it. Um, when Jesus says he's the Lord of the Sabbath, well, of course, he gave the Sabbath. Um, his being the Lord of the Sabbath doesn't mean that we don't keep it. There were a lot of traditions that were written connected with the Sabbath that weren't biblical. Matter of fact, Christ said several times to the Jews, why do you keep your tradition and violate the commandments of God? Or he said you have a fine way of putting aside the commandments of God to observe your tradition. There's several variations of that. There's a big conflict between man-made laws Every dispute that Jesus had with the religious leaders regarding the Sabbath never had to do with, do you keep the Sabbath? It was always about, how do you keep the Sabbath? He said it's better to do good on the Sabbath day. Jesus would heal it. He understood how the Sabbath should be kept because who wrote the Ten Commandments? All things that were made were made by him. I think Christ was there writing it in stone, uh, just like he was writing on the dust of the temple uh, floor with a woman caught in adultery. And so um, I believe that the Ten Commandments um, are to be written in the heart. Uh, Jesus, when he said, I am Lord of the Sabbath, he said, you can't be telling me I don't know how to keep the Sabbath. And it's like when Steve referred to the priests. As he said, they profane, Jesus says, they profane the Sabbath, yet they're guiltless because they're doing the work that God told them to do on that day. And so God specifies in his word how seconds. the Sabbath is to be kept. I'll pause there. We'll get more questions. Okay. 
All right, Steve, one minute to respond. Your time starts now. All right, I believe that Jesus, when he said he's the Lord of the Sabbath, should be understood in the context of what he said. And Douglas mentioned the context. He's just said the priests profane the Sabbath and are guiltless. But he said, but one much greater than the temple is here. Why do you say that? Because he knew that the Pharisees would say, well, they could do that because they're doing the work of the temple. They can profane the Sabbath because they're doing temple work. He says, yeah, but one greater than the temple is here. He was defending his disciples. If you read the context of Matthew chapter 12 from the first verse, he was defending his disciples because they were doing something that he didn't object to, but the Pharisees did. Their obligation is to do what he wanted them to do, not what somebody else wanted, not even what, the, what a group of laws do, because he's the Lord. And their obligation is to obey the Lord. He said, he's the Lord even of the Sabbath. He didn't just say, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. He said, I'm the Lord even of the Sabbath, meaning all the other days too, and the Sabbath. My disciples only have to wonder about whether they're doing what I want, because I'm the Lord every day, even on the Sabbath day. Okay, this question is for Steve. There was a few reference, a few folks that in reference you mentioned that Jesus had broke the law. Mm -hmm. Where in the Bible does it say that he broke the Sabbath? It says it specifically in, oh, sorry. Your time starts now. It says it specifically in John chapter 5 and verse 18. Now, what it says is, therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill Jesus because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Now it says, and, and the person who said he broke the Sabbath is John. The Pharisees didn't say Jesus broke the Sabbath. They wanted to kill him because he had, John says. John is the one who has assessed what Jesus did as breaking the Sabbath. And he said, therefore they wanted to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but that he also said his father is God. Now, some say, well, but he can't break the Sabbath because he's, he, that'd make him a sinner. No, it would not. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. He has authority to do whatever he wants on the Sabbath. He's not under the Sabbath, it's under him. If he's the Lord of the Sabbath, the Sabbath is under him, not him under it. Just like a policeman can go down the highway at 90 miles an hour over the speed limit, certainly, with his lights flashing and siren on, because he's authorized to. I can't do that. I'd be breaking a law that I'm not allowed to break. The policeman's violating the speed limit, but he's authorized to do it. Jesus could uh, violate the Sabbath or many other laws, like the dietary laws. Uh, he could, you know, uh, he could let people touch him if, he's, if they've got an issue of blood. They could, he could do things that the law didn't permit because he's the Lord. He was the Lord of the Sabbath, and therefore, see, they didn't believe he was. So when he broke the Sabbath 30 seconds. and said that his father was God, that offended them. They wanted to kill him. But it's not them that said he broke the Sabbath. It's John that says he did. It's John's assessment. You can't read that verse honestly without recognizing that it's John who tells us Jesus broke the Sabbath. All right, Doug, you have one minute to respond to that. Your time starts now. I believe when John said because he had broken the Sabbath, and it does say that, Jesus broke their regulations relating to the Sabbath, we've got to be careful not to read too much into what others said about Jesus because they said that Jesus was um, a Samaritan. He was demon-possessed. They said that um, uh, I, he was... Uh, a lie, a drunkard, a wine bibber, and Jesus wasn't any of those things. Sin, we've got to be careful about saying Jesus could whimsically just break his own law because sin is defined as transgression of the law. And we are saved because Jesus was sinless. And um, it says, who committed no sin? If you look in John chapter 15, verse 10, Jesus said, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I don't believe that Jesus ever broke the Ten Commandments. Okay, time up. The next question that we have is addressed to Doug. We'll read the question and then two minutes start. Does the Bible tell us what to do and not to do on the Sabbath? Time starts now. Well, you start with the very basics in the actual Sabbath command. It says, thou shalt not do any labor. That's talking about your customary work, I think the word is used. Uh, later, um, Moses defines it a little more strictly and he said if you're going to eat, he says bake what you're going to bake and seethe what you're going to seethe 
uh, Nehemiah, I think it's chapter 13, he gives some of the, um, the pagans living around Jerusalem a hard time because they kept coming on the Sabbath to sell wares and things to the people and he warned them once or twice, said you come back I'll arrest you. Sabbath's not a day for regular buying and selling merchandising. It's holy time. And what I'm sharing with you is not the belief of a particular denomination. If you look all through the history of the, um, the Protestant reformers, though they may have disagreed on what that day was, they all believed that the Sabbath day was to be treated uh, sacredly. It was a uh, holy time. I believe we should worship God seven days a week. We sleep every night. So we all need that kind of rest. So the rest of the Sabbath is a different kind of rest. It's a resting where we're putting aside uh, all the cares of life and we have quality time with God. There's a lot of times when I'm in the house and I'm working in my office and Karen will say, we're not doing anything together. I'll say, oh, I was in the office. I was here all the time. She's, no, you weren't really here. <laughs> she says, so God is saying, look, I want quality time with you. And he's, you know, it's like in the Garden of Eden. He was walking in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve ran from him. He wants to spend time with us. So the Sabbath mostly is sacred time. You put aside all the secular concerns. You try to get everything out of the way so that you can have that, that blessed time with God without interruption. All right, Steve, you'll have one minute to respond. And your time starts now. Doug is correct that the Bible does say a lot of those things about keeping the Sabbath. It doesn't say any of them in the Ten Commandments except the resting part. There's no gathering for a holy convocation. There's no anything like that in the Ten Commandments. There's just resting. Even when they gathered manna, they were not told to gather together on the seventh day. Just don't gather manna on the seventh day. The gathering on the seventh day is not commanded in the Ten Commandments. And therefore, if what Moses wrote is not binding, then meeting on the Sabbath is not binding. It's true, you can meet on the Sabbath, and I wouldn't complain about anyone doing so, or any other day of the week for that matter. But as far as what you're not allowed to do, if you're going to keep the Sabbath, you can't kindle a fire in your home. That's forbidden on the Sabbath. And uh, that's, you know, that's actually in the same laws that say you have to get together on the Sabbath for worship. So, you know, people can pick and choose what laws they want to keep if they're going to be under the law, but they'll have to answer to the law uh, if they don't keep everything written in the law. Okay, well, we have run out of the time that we had allotted to questions. Uh, we were going to take a little time for closing statements, but let me first of all ask our presenters, do you want to take a couple more questions before we close out that question time, or do we want to go to the Why don't we do a couple? Well, let's do two more questions. Okay, yeah. two more questions and each, and then we'll have closing statements. The next question is going to go to uh, Steve, and uh, the, you'll have two minutes to respond to the question. Okay, this is one I'm going to have to look carefully at. It's a, very, it's a long question, so put your thinking cap on. Under what circumstances is it appropriate, if at all, to cherry pick from God's law? And this is, this is part of the question. It continues. Paul the Apostle refers to it as the law of freedom and love. And if the grace of Jesus is sufficient enough, isn't it not presumptuous to assume that God would later amend his expectations that previously were used to condemn lawbreakers. Steve, you will have two minutes to respond, and your time starts now. I'm not sure I understand that question uh, thoroughly. <laughs> uh, I don't believe that God has ever changed his moral standards because God doesn't change, and moral standards are based on God's character. Loving your neighbor as you love yourself is always required. Loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength is always required. And that's what Paul said. That's what Jesus said. Uh, I don't see any change there. I'm not sure what's being implied there. To I don't know what the question is really about. It, inconsistent for God to change or condemn people. or I don't remember what that really was saying. Yeah, it may just be in reference to seeing that as a change in the law, meaning removing well, the requirement well, sure. of the I Sabbath. Mean, we know God changed the law. It says that in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 12. It says there being a change in the priesthood, there's necessarily a change of the law. Uh, so the law has changed. The question of in what ways has it changed? In my opinion, the ways it's changed is that it's written in, God has written his moral commands, the things that have to do with his character. 
in our hearts so that we become like him. We become imitators of God as dear children, as Paul says in Ephesians 5.1. And we want to because it's in our heart like it's in the heart of a child to imitate their parents. That would be my understanding of that. Um, the law has changed in the ceremonial ways and all the holy days and holy places and holy people, uh, you know, priests and so forth, those are all part of the ceremonies of the law and I don't believe those are carried over because, as I said, ceremonial laws point forward to something bigger than themselves. 30 they're seconds. They're symbolic, they're shadows, and they point to something that's permanent, which is spiritual. And the Sabbath is just as much a ceremonial law as the others in that, in, in, in that nature. Okay, Doug, you have one minute for your response. It starts now. Well, a lot of people, I think, uh, misunderstand some of the things that Paul has said. Uh, Paul says in Romans chapter 2, for instance, verse 13, for not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. He said, do we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Uh, the whole purpose of the gospel is to save us from our lawlessness. It saves us from our lying and our stealing. Covetousness deals with our thinking. Uh, where that Jesus said, there's the letter of the law, you're not to commit adultery, then there's the spirit of the law, you're not to be thinking it in your heart. The letter of the law says don't murder, then there's the spirit of the law, do not be angry with your brother without uh, cause. And so, in the same way, you're still supposed to keep the letter of the law when you have the spirit, same way with the Sabbath. We rest in Jesus, the Sabbath talks about, but do we stop needing the moral, um, part of the law that says rest one day a week? Okay Doug, we got two more questions left and we'll have one more for Steve following this. This is a longer question, I'll summarize it. It says, if Sabbath keeping is a requisite for salvation, what can be said about past Christian leaders and thinkers like Augustine, Wycliffe, Huss, Tyndale, Luther, etc., all of whom were exhaustive biblical and linguistic scholars, will God hold them accountable for not keeping the Sabbath? And if not, why would we assume that God would expect us to keep it today? The time starts now. Who's starting? Oh, me. I thought he was starting. Okay. <laughs> I was wondering why that long pause was happening. <laughs> um, uh, first of all, I don't think anybody is saved by keeping the Sabbath commandment any more than any other commandment. People say, well, do you think that it's a salvation issue? Uh, you know, I just say, well, you put it in the same category with the other nine. I, I don't think God gives us a 10% discount. Will there be people in heaven uh, that didn't know some of the commandments? Yes, of course. There'll be people in heaven that had way too many wives. Uh, sin is knowing to do good and not doing it. It says if you continue to sin, Hebrews chapter 10, 26, after you receive a knowledge of the truth, then there remains no more sacrifice for sin. And the list of uh, reformers that was mentioned here, all of them believed in the Sabbath. The question was, which day? But none of them said that the Sabbath was done away with. Augustine, Luther, Calvin, uh, the great reformers, the, the Baptist Confession, the Westminster Confession, they all believed the Sabbath was established in Genesis chapter 2. It was still to be kept. The contention was on what day it was to be kept. Um, so there's going to be people in heaven that maybe didn't know. Uh, there'll be all kinds of people. David had way too many wives. I expect to see him in heaven. Solomon had even more. If we did that today, well, I know I'd be dead. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so, you know, we, we, we need to walk in the light that he gives us. And I think that God wants people to seconds. learn the light about the Sabbath. I think as we get closer to the second coming, that um, there's going to be more digging in God's Word. I think conditions in the world are going to drive people to their Bibles, and I believe there's going to be a revival of primitive godliness that was once delivered unto the saints. That'll be keeping the new covenant Sabbath. Okay, Steve, you'll have one minute to respond. We'll tell you when it begins. Your time starts now. Well, it's true that Doug doesn't believe anyone will be saved by keeping the Sabbath, but I believe that many Seventh-day Adventists believe that many will go to hell for not keeping the Sabbath when it becomes the mark of the beast. Once there's a national Sunday law, if you begin to worship on Sunday and not on Saturday, you will be taking the mark of the beast and certainly Revelation says you'll go to hell if that's the case. So 
It's not like the other ten, other nine commandments, is it? It's quite unique. No one goes to hell inevitably for stealing. But if you're going to go to hell because you don't keep the Sabbath, then it is definitely very much a salvation issue, at least with the Seventh-day Adventist theology, as I understand it. Uh, so sometimes they'll say it's not a salvation issue in order to not make it seem like the issue that it is to them. But they believe that it's going to be the testing truth of the end times, and people who don't keep the Sabbath will indeed go to hell because they're taking the mark of the beast. Okay, this will be, Steve, this will be your last question, and you'll have two minutes to respond. The question is, if God did away with the old covenant, what is the new law? Your time starts now. Jesus said in John 8, 31, if you continue in my words, you're my disciples indeed. When he sent out the disciples to, on the Great Commission in Matthew 28, he says, go and make disciples teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 9, said that when he's with the Jews, he acts like a Jew. When he's with those who are under the law, he keeps the law. But when he's not, he doesn't keep the law. He says, however, I'm not without law. I'm not lawless. I'm under the law to Christ. I don't have to keep the Jewish law when I'm with Jewish people because I'm not under that law. But I am under the law of Christ, he said. And therefore, what is the new covenant? Christ is the new covenant. Christ is the new covenant. In Isaiah, God says to the Messiah, I will give you as a covenant to the people. He is the new covenant. It's all about him. It's not about keeping this rule or that rule or keeping that day or that day. It's about Jesus. It's about following Jesus and being totally devoted to him and doing what he said to do. He's the Lord. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord? And you don't do the things that I say. Now, Jesus never said a word about keeping the Sabbath that we can read in the New Testament. And yes, he was God. Sometimes you say, well, he was God to give the Ten Commandments. He was, his disciples didn't know he was God, not at that point. They learned it later on. They still thought he was, you know, dead and gone permanently when he was dead. They didn't know who he was, uh, not yet. They said, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? They didn't know he was God. They learned that 30 later seconds. On. But what he told them, what he commanded them is what he commanded them when he taught them. There's no reason to believe that they understood everything that he had said to include keeping the, all the laws of the Old Testament, keeping the sa sacrificial system and so forth. That's not part of, even though Jesus gave those laws in the Old Testament, that's not part of what he's talking about being his disciple. We all know that. We all know we don't offer animal sacrifices anymore. Okay, Doug, you have a one minute response. That time starts now. Well, I believe that we're supposed to keep uh, in, it's not all the laws in the Bible we're talking about. Um, my contention is we're talking about the Ten Commandments. Uh, it's, to me, it's so easy. I think a child could understand it. You've got a complete set. God delivered them as a set. Uh, and when you tell them this is the moral law, God has your mind. He owns your property. He owns your relationships in the Seventh Commandment. And he owns our time. And so it is a moral law. Um, it's not just about resting. It's also about um, observing this sacred time, recognizing that he is our God. You live in a dimension called time. And God is saying, look, if you believe that my time belongs to you, then keep it holy. Okay, we have time for one more question. And Doug, this question will go to you. And then Steve, you'll have a minute to respond following. And the last question that we have, someone asks, can you celebrate both days? So I'd assume they're talking about the seventh day Sabbath and the first day Sunday, and your time starts now. Well, Jesus said you can't t serve two masters. Uh, if God says, I bless the seventh day, uh, the word that he uses is a definite article. He doesn't say, I bless a seventh day. It was the seventh day. And it was so serious to the people of God that during the time of Moses, when he was reminding them about the Sabbath, somebody who was breaking it was brought to Moses. They said, what do we do? And he said, same penalty as the other laws. It was a death penalty. And so, you know, we're talking about something pretty important, friends. I know that this is a, a friendly dialogue. But if sin is a transgression of the law, and you have to ask, do the Ten Commandments matter? I mean, what in the Bible? The Bible is the Word of God. What words did God give the greatest priority to? 
It seems to me that he gave a very great priority to the Ten Commandments in the way he spoke it, in the way he wrote it, in the way he preserved it. And it's repeated, I believe, all through the Bible. I think you find in um, Hebrews, it tells us there remains therefore a Sabbath for the people of God. And then you read in Hebrews chapter 10, 26, or a little after that, 28, do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And so he says, you've got a Sabbath. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And so, uh, yeah, I think this is very important. Uh, Steve made a reference to what Adventists believe about the last days. We're just looking at what the Bible says. There was a test in the time of Daniel where an international law said seconds. break the law of God or die. There was a test for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Government said break the law or die. We just think that there's going to be a similar test in the last day and the Sabbath is going to be a point of controversy. We freely admit that. Uh, I believe there's a lot of good people that may not know that, but when it becomes a test, we need to take a, take a stand for what the Word says. All right, Steve, you've got one minute to respond, and that'll bring an end to our question answer time, and your time starts now. All right. Yeah, there are a lot of good people who don't know that the mark of the beast is uh, failure to keep the Sabbath, and part of the reason is that although lots of good people read the Bible, they don't find it there. I don't, and I've been told to find it there by my Seventh-day Adventist friends. I look, and it's still not there. There's nothing in the Bible. It's the teachings of Ellen G. White. It's not the Bible that says that the mark of the beast is, of course, the keeping of Sunday. Now, the question was, is it okay to worship both days? I worship all days, so two days isn't enough. Seven is enough. Now, is it okay to not do your normal work two days? Well, I hope so, because that almost everyone has a two-day weekend. And therefore, they do observe a cessation of their ordinary work. Not everybody does. I don't know if all Seventh-day Adventists do, but most people take a two-day weekend. Uh, again, the Sabbath rest is to stop doing your ordinary work. You work six days and take one day off. Uh, is it okay to work five days and take two days off? Well, if not, then an awful lot of people are in trouble, and that's very possible. But I don't, I don't think up. God's that kind of legalistic. Okay. Well, we want to thank everybody for their questions that came in. Some good questions. We're going to be closing out this time together with a three-minute summary from each speaker. And Steve, you will lead when you are ready. And then uh, following that, Doug, we'll let you know when your time will begin. All right. I'll start now. Time starts now. Doug mentioned that in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 9, there's a statement, there remains a rest to the people of God. It actually says a Sabbath rest to the people of God. But is it talking about the Old Testament Sabbath, or is it talking about a spiritual Sabbath? That's, I'm sure, disputed. Paul did say in another place, in 1 Corinthians 5, we keep the feast of unleavened bread. But he said, we do it with the unleavened bread of uh, sincerity and truth. It's a spiritual thing we do. The keeping of the feast for the Christian is spiritual. The rest of God that the writer of Hebrews talks about cannot be the Sabbath rest for the following reasons. One is because it was foreshadowed by the Sabbath and Canaan, according to Hebrews 4, 4 and 4, 8. The Sabbath was a foreshadowing of the rest of God and so was Canaan rest, but neither of them were the rest itself. It is entered by believing. You don't enter into Sabbath rest by believing. You do it by ceasing to work. Uh, but the, this rest of God is entered by believing in the finished work of Christ, in, in Christ's death and him sitting at the right hand of God, not offering further uh, sacrifices. The rest is uh, not a command, but it's a promise. In the right of Hebrews chapter 4, it says there's a promise of entering into rest. You don't have to promise somebody that they'll stop working on Saturday. Anyone can do that without being promised that or not. This is a promise of God that the, the Sabbath rest of the Old Testament was itself a promise, as all the ritual laws were, of something spiritual that God was going to do. It's, he's not talking about a commanded rest in Hebrews 4. He's talking about a promised rest. Uh, it says in Hebrews 4, 7, and 8 that it had not been entered into even in David's time. That's why he wrote Psalm 95, telling his people, let's not neglect to enter it. And yet, in David's time and long before they were keeping the Sabbath rest, the rest of God is a different kind of rest. It's a rest that is not entered weekly. It is a rest that we have all entered. It's in the aorist tense in Hebrews 4.10. 
He who has believed has entered into God's rest. It's been done once for all. That's what the tense means. It's not a weekly thing that's repeated. And also, you don't have to wait to the end of the week to do it because in Hebrews 4, 7, it says today, enter into his rest. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Today, every 30 day. 30 seconds. It's an everyday rest. It's not a seventh day rest. It's a spiritual rest. As Doug in his presentation said, Jesus said, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. You'll find rest to your soul. It's a spiritual rest. And the burden that you're relieved of is the yoke of the law. Take my yoke instead and learn from me and you'll find rest to your soul. Thank you. While they're resetting the clock, you want to join me in thanking our moderators for doing a very good job tonight. <laughs> Amen. All right. Okay, Doug, your three minutes starts now. I do think we're living in the last days. There's going to be a big battle in the last days regarding the beast and the mark of the beast. Talks about a mark in the hand and in the forehead. If you look in Deuteronomy chapter, you look in Deuteronomy chapter uh, 6, Moses in Deuteronomy 5 gives the Ten Commandments. Deuteronomy 6, he says, these words I command you shall be in your heart. And he said, you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. Right there in Deuteronomy, he's saying the law is to be in our hand, in our actions, in and our mind, meaning in our hearts. Uh, God wants to write his law in our hearts. I think that's the new covenant. And I think Steve and I agree on that. I just don't think that we get a 10% discount. I think that it's all 10 commandments that are written in the heart. I see the Sabbath going back before sin. I see it uh, instituted right there at creation. And you know, whenever you're in doubt about what to do, I always think it's a good policy to do the safe thing. I know that in the judgment day, I'm not going to be in trouble with the Lord. And, he, and I say, Lord, what's the problem? He says, you kept one commandment too many. Uh, you weren't supposed to be keeping the Sabbath day. But I said, Lord, you said it. You wrote it with your finger. You spoke it. You said, if I love you, keep your commandments. This is right here in the very bosom of the Ten Commandments. Everybody believes in keeping all the others. Uh, I wasn't raised a Seventh-day Adventist. Matter of fact, Steve and I kind of came to the Lord during the same age in Southern California. And uh, I just studied I thought it was inconsistent that you could go to 99% uh, of the churches and I could preach on the other nine commandments and people would say amen. But then you preach about the one commandment where God says, don't forget this one. And they'd say, no, no, that's the one we're supposed to forget. And so I've just seen as I look at history, as I look at the word of God, that there's nothing inconsistent with wanting to keep the commandments as a whole, not to be saved, but because we love the Lord, and I do think that our obedience is going to be a point of a, a major test in the last days. And so um, this is a very serious question. As we're talking here about the Word of God, we're talking about the law of God, we're talking about salvation. I believe we're saved by grace, we're saved from our sin, but sin is the transgression of the law. And so um, 30 seconds. God wants to write His law in our heart. Jesus died on the cross because of our law breaking. I think it's also interesting the time of year we're actually having this debate. It's Good Friday. Do you realize the disciples, the Sabbath was so important to them, they would not finish embalming Jesus' body for fear of breaking the Sabbath. It says they went home and kept the Sabbath according to the commandment. Not the Jewish commandment. The commandment of God. I think that's one that should be in our hearts too. Time's Thank up. you very much. All right. We again would like to thank Steve for joining us this evening and I understand your wife is with you and we didn't take the time to introduce her and you need to remind me of your name again. Dana. Dana, Dana would you just stand and wave so everybody can see you kind of putting you on the spot there. We're delighted they chose to join us this evening and Karen Batchelor you might as well stand too and wave. This is Doug's, Doug's wife.
And again, we want to thank all of you for coming out and joining us. Our friends who are watching on Facebook, we'd also like to thank you for participating. I know we got some Facebook questions that came in. So thank you for those questions. Once again, we just remind you, if you want to study this further, two websites. The one is with Steve, and it's the narrow path. Maybe you can put that on the screen. The narrowpath.com. The narrowpath.com is the website. Uh, if you want to learn more about Sabbath, it's presented by Pastor Doug. Sabbathtruth.com is a website you can go to. There it is, sabbathtruth.org. I think .org or .com will take you to the same one. And maybe we could put Steve's website up one more time. Let's see if they're able to pull that. There it is, so you can see it. The narrowpath.com, and you can go to that website for more information. Again, thank you everybody for joining us. I want to have a closing word of prayer, and then we are free to dismiss. Dear Father in heaven, again, we thank you for the opportunity that we had this evening to open up your word and, and discuss and share. I think, uh, I think your heart, Lord, is filled with joy when we take a serious look at your word and we prayerfully consider what it says. It seems that there are so many in the world today even amongst professed Christians that don't take the time to really study the scriptures, to look at it closely. So thank you for this group that's here this evening. Thank you for the presentations that have been made. And I pray that this would stimulate in our hearts and minds to study further. Thank you, Father, for your promise to be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, thank you for joining us. Good evening. Have a wonderful rest of the evening.